from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Oh, my goodness. And thank you all for coming today. I'm Robert Saladini with the John W. Kluge Center, and we're delighted to welcome you to this talk today by Mark Katz, titled Capturing Sound, How Technology Has Changed Music. The talk is based on Dr. Katz's recent book with the same title. Please know that this event is being videotaped for the Library of Congress website and elsewhere. After Dr. Katz's comments, he has agreed to answer questions from the audience. Please know that by asking a question, you, we, uh, which we hope you'll keep short, and to the point, you are giving tacit agreement to being videotaped. Through archaeological finds and ethnographic studies, we know that prehistoric man invented music ages ago. Beyond basic foreign forms of communication, it could be argued that music is among the most natural and original forms created by man to express himself. Stones, bones, pieces of wood, hollow vessels, cups, these all make sounds when pushed, beaten, or rubbed together. Stretched hides can bang, the murmuring and whistling of the wind can be caught in reeds, bone pipes, or through hollow branches. Men even discovered the echo, perhaps the world's most primitive playback device. In today's talk, Dr. Katz will explore with us other ways that technology has changed music, especially from the late 19th century up to the present time. It is a special pleasure for us to welcome Mark Katz here today. You see, Mark Katz is a former Library of Congress employee. He worked in both the motion picture broadcast and recorded sound division and in the music division. I know that he played a major part in processing and organizing the personal papers of the violinist Yasha Heifetz, which for Mark as a violinist himself must have been a special joy. Today, with a PhD in musicology from the University of Michigan, he is on the faculty of the Peabody Conservatory of Music and is the author of the soon to be published The Violin, a Research and Information Guide. At home, in both the classical and popular music worlds, he has written any number of articles uh, on music for American music, the Beethoven Forum, the Harvard Dictionary of Music, the International Dictionary of Black Composers, Journals of Musicological Research, Musik in Geschichte und Gegenwart, and Notes. He's received awards from the American Musicological Society and from the British Library. And his current projects include a reader on music and technology and a book length study on race and technology in hip hop turntablism. So, Please join me in welcoming Mark Katz. Well, thanks so much, Bob. That was a very nice introduction. And you're right, it was a real joy to work here. I think it was 1992 or 93. I was uh, just finishing up my undergraduate degree and I came to uh, un uninvited and unannounced to the uh, music division and asked uh, then Chief um, James Pruitt if I could, if I could work on the Heifetz collection. And uh, I wasn't a very good bargainer because I said I'd do it free. Um, all I wanted to do is, is hang out with Heifetz's stuff. And, um, and it worked and I was there for a year in both music and then in uh, recorded sound. And um, I see people I know from when I worked there, so it looks like I didn't burn too many bridges. But uh, in any case, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Not only did I work here, but I did a lot of my research here for this book. So thank you again. Now in the first half of my talk, I'll discuss some of the main points in my book, and I'll play for you some illustrative musical examples. In the second half, I'll present some recent research I've been doing, specifically on some new developments in internet file sharing. But before that, I'd like to offer an anecdote and a thought experiment. First, the anecdote. Several years ago, I was visiting my parents, and while I was there, my then four-year-old nephew came for the day. 
At one point, my mother was playing the piano, which my nephew watched with absolute fascination. He walked around the piano several times and looked underneath it and peeked, up, peeked inside the lid. Finally, he interrupted my mother and asked with obvious puzzlement, Grandma, where are the speakers? <laughs> my nephew offers us a vivid reminder of the ubiquity of mediated music. For his generation and for many in generations before him, music is something that is primarily heard through loudspeakers and only secondarily experienced live. I should point out that when phonographs were first introduced, children were known to look for the musicians whom they mu thought must be hiding inside the recording horn. Although the incident with my nephew may seem rather trivial, it points to the profound influence of sound recording, the subject of my talk and the subject of my book. But how exactly does sound recording technology affect our musical lives? And how are we to understand the influence of a technology that pervades our everyday existence so thoroughly that we are hardly aware of it? This last question leads me to my thought experiment. I'd like you to imagine a world without recorded sound. This is no simple task, so we're going to have to do some house cleaning. Imagine all the world's CDs, LPs, cassettes, DATs, reel-to-reels, eight-track tapes, 45s, and 78s in a pile, and the library would have contributed a large portion of that pile. Now imagine it's gone. But we're not done. We also have to hand over our stereo equipment, clock radios, Walkman, iPods, and even cell phones. While we're at it, we'll have to get rid of TVs, DVD players, VCRs, car stereos, and computers. If you have young children, you'll also have to part with all those relentlessly chirpy musical toys. I have an 18-month-old daughter, and I can't walk 10 feet in my house without kicking one of those toys, sometimes even accidentally. <laughs> There's actually quite a bit more left, but let's assume that every trace of recording technology is gone. On top of this, your memory of all this technology has to disappear as well. Okay, now imagine that you encounter, for the first time, a musical recording. Say, for example, that you walk into a room, empty except for a medium-sized wooden box, and emanating from it is a human voice, singing. What would your reaction be? How would you explain a voice without a body? You might well think that you were witnessing some kind of magic, or perhaps you would question your sanity. But whether magic or madness, this experience would be wholly beyond the scope of your everyday existence, and very different from any normal encounter with music that you would have ever had. And that brings me to a simple but crucial point. Live and recorded music are very different things. This is crucial because if we want to understand the influence of recording, we must take as our starting point its distinctiveness, its fundamental differences from the traditional means of making and experiencing music. There are several key differences between live and recorded music. When performed live, music is fleeting, evanescent. Recordings, however, capture these fugitive sounds, tangibly preserving them on physical media, whether wax cylinders, plastic CDs, or the hard drives of computers. Once musical sound is reified, made into a thing, it becomes transportable, saleable, collectible, and manipulable in ways that had never been possible before. And like Billy Pilgrim and Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, Recorded sound comes unstuck in time. Recorded music can be heard after it was originally performed and repeated more or less indefinitely. The dead can speak to the living. The march of time can be halted. As I, as I will explain, the distinctive aspects of recorded sound have encouraged new ways of listening to music, led performers to change their practices, and allowed entirely new musical genres to come into existence. This leads me to the thesis of my book. My thesis is that sound recording, far from being simply a preservational tool, is in reality a catalyst, one that has profoundly influenced the way music has been heard, performed, and composed for, over a, more, than a, for more than a century. It is from this idea of recording's catalytic nature that I've developed the concept of the phonograph effect. Simply put, a phonograph effect is any change in musical behavior whether listening, performing, or composing, that has arisen in response to sound recording technology. So let me take a moment to explain exactly what I mean by this. When I speak of recording's influence, I'm speaking of observable changes 
and activities of listeners, performers, and composers. It's not enough just to say that recording has changed our musical lives, as we often say. We have to be able to explain recording's influence in practical terms. If, for example, recording has influenced violin playing or hip hop, or hip hop violin playing for that matter, we must actually be able to hear this change in violin playing or hip hop. In other words, we must have evidence of recording's influence. A second point of clarification. When I say that recording influences musical activity, I'm not saying that it somehow acts upon us or forces us to act against our will. Rather, the influence of technology really resides in our responses to it. So if the impact of recording manifests itself in the actions of its users, what exactly are they, that is we, responding to? The answer leads to a central premise in capturing sound, that the influence of this technology is ultimately generated by our responses to differences between live and recorded music. This may seem rather abstract. How does one react to a difference? So let me offer some specific examples of the ways in which recording influences our musical activities. I'll discuss three phonograph effects, examples that reveal the influence of recording on listening, performing, and composing. So I'd like to begin with an example, the example of solitary listening. The technology of sound recording has allowed listeners to determine, with far more control than had ever been possible before, when, where, and with whom they listen to music. The act of listening to music alone has been an important manifestation of this possibility. And today, with headphones, iPods, car stereos, uh, shower stereos, and the like, the practice is commonplace. We shouldn't think, however, that solitary listening was always so common or acceptable. Consider a 1923 article in a British journal that posed the following question. How might you react upon walking into a room to discover a friend listening to a phonograph alone? Shocking, I know. The author's answer is revealing, and I quote, you would think it odd, would you not? You'd look twice to see whether some other person were not hidden in some corner of the room, and if you found no such one, would painfully blush, as if you had discovered your friend sniffing cocaine or emptying a bottle of whiskey. People, we think, should not do things to themselves, however much they may enjoy doing them in company. And I fear that if I were discovered listening to the Fifth Symphony without a chaperone to guarantee my sanity, my friends would fall away with grievous shaking of the head. Even if a bit melodramatic, these remarks remind us that before the advent of recording, listening to music had always been a communal activity. In pre-phonographic times, it had been, for the most part, neither practical nor possible to hear music alone. Imagine what it would take to hear a live performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony alone, for example. You'd have to be extremely rich or powerful or both. Music had always accompanied central communal events, such as birth and death rites, weddings, and religious festivals. Therefore, solitary listening, even though it may seem unremarkable today, is in fact quite remarkable for it contradicts centuries of tradition and challenges long-held notions about the function of music. So we can understand this change as a response among listeners to certain distinctive aspects of sound recording, specifically the portability that allows one to take music where one wants and the repeatability that allows one to hear and rehear music at will. Solitary listening then may be considered a phonograph effect. Now, an example of what might be called a performative phonograph effect is crooning. Crooning, co common in the popular music of the 1920s to 1950s, and we still hear some of it today, was a technique in which a vocalist sang softly and very close to the microphone to get a smooth, mellow sound. I don't know if I should try it, but um, no, I won't. Uh, but uh, it's actually a very, uh, uh, it's a real technique that uh, had to be developed. And let me uh, play for you a master at it, Bing Crosby. And uh, this is our first example from P.S. I Love You.
think this is John Cage's arrangement. No, okay, here it is. Everybody's thinking of you. Yes, I love you. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. Now, it's important to realize that crooning was really only possible with the electronic amplification of the microphone. For without amplification, it would be expressively flat and nearly inaudible. So crooning was developed in response to a possibility of recording technology not available in acoustic live performance. Interestingly, crooning can also be understood as a response to another distinctive aspect of recording, the separation of performer and listener, in which the musicians are invisible to and physically distant from their audience. Crooning is akin to whispering, which under normal circumstances can only be heard when one is physically very close to the person speaking. Crooning thus provides a sense of intimacy between artist and audience, collapsing the technologically imposed dif distance that would seem to preclude such a relationship. Again, as a response to multiple aspects of recording, crooning can be seen as an example of a phonograph effect. Now, a final example comes from the German composer Paul Hindemith. In 1930, Hindemith created two works, one vocal and one instrumental, which he called Trick Aufnahmen, or trick recordings. He called them trick recordings because it made possible for one musician to do what would normally require an ensemble, and as such were perhaps the first works written specifically and solely for the medium of sound recording. Consider, for example, the untitled instrumental trick Aufnahme. It seems to be scored for xylophone, violin, and cello. Most likely, however, Hindemith used only a xylophone and a viola, and changed the speed of the recording to create higher and lower string sounds. The viola, sometimes as violin, sometimes as cello, plays pizzicato throughout, combining with the xylophone, itself heard at differing speeds, to create a lively study in timbre and polyphony. It must have been tremendously difficult for Hindemith to create this work. Had mag magnetic tape been available, the piece would have been a fairly simple matter. But these techniques of overdubbing and splicing became feasible only after World War II. Hindemith likely had nothing more than a disc-cutting phonograph and microphones. So we can imagine the complex choreography of the process, with Hindemith moving from viola to xylophone to play each part, and then from phonograph to phonograph to start, stop, and change speeds. Poor timing or clumsy movements would have ruined the work. So I'd like you to hear a little bit of this piece. I should note that for decades, this music was thought to have been lost, and only in the 1980s did it turn up in Berlin. The recording, I'm happy to say, was published for the first time in the CD that accompanies my book. So let's hear uh, this uh, Hindemith piece. <laughs> So why would Hindemith put so much energy into a piece he could have very easily written in the traditional way? He, like a number of other avant-garde composers at the time, was looking for ways to create and disseminate music that did not need to depend on the interpretive decisions of performers. Or to be more blunt, he wanted to get the performer out of the picture. The phonograph made this possible. And again, we should see Hindemith's trick Aufnahme as a phonograph effect. For exploiting the ability to manipulate sound after its creation, he was responding to a distinctive aspect of the technology. We might well think that solitary listening is a perfectly natural and acceptable way to experience music, or that Bing Crosby's crooning or Paul Hindemith's music from 1930 was driven solely by aesthetic concerns. Yet technology was a driving force in each of these cases, and in fact made all three possible. And it's important to realize that these are not abstractions, but observable and lasting changes in music and musical life. 
There are, in fact, innumerable such phonograph effects. But I hope that these three brief examples give you a hint of the deep and pervasive influence of sound recording technology. What I'd like to do now is to switch gears and explore another phonograph effect, but a much more recent manifestation of recording's influence. This is a case study that reflects some of my newer research into the phenomenon of what is known as file sharing. So I'm driving down the road when a song on the radio catches my ear. It has a descending tetrachord in it, and I collect descending tetrachords. A descending tetrachord, by the way, is a repeated descending four-note phrase, and don't ask me why I collect them. I fumble around for a pen to make note of the song. I can't find one, so I take out my cell phone and call home. I then have the following slightly surreal conversation with my voicemail. Uh, hi, Mark. It's Mark. Um, okay, descending tetrachord. Pretty sure it's a violent femme song. The lyrics go, beautiful girl, love the dress. Okay, got that? Okay, see you soon. <laughs> when I get home to my computer, I Google the phrase, beautiful girl, love the dress, and the word lyrics. The resulting list of websites points me to some of the many lyrics databases that populate the internet. All of them tell me that what I heard was a 1983 song called Gone Daddy Gone by, as I had sus suspected, the Violent Femmes. Next, I open up a program that helps me find the song on the internet. This program searches through the computers of a few million people who have allowed others access to their digitized music collections. On this occasion, I get a list of a few dozen different computer users who, have all got, who all have the song on their hard drives. So, with a double click of the mouse, I start copying Gone Daddy Gone, and a few minutes later I'm listening to the song. So here's a little bit of what I heard. I'll point out the descending tetrachord. In my mind, this qualifies as magic. Not so much the song, which I happen to like, but the fact that I was more or less able to conjure it out of thin air. And this example is just one of many millions playing out daily across the globe, one that represents a revolution in the way music is disseminated and experienced. Is it, a it is a revolution that allows nearly instant musical gratification, one in which wishing virtually makes it so. But as I hope to show, the, ev the effect of this revolution fomented by the phenomenon known as file sharing, is much more far-reaching than that. For the benefit of those unfamiliar with file sharing, let me briefly explain. It is a means of distributing digital files through networks of computers whose users have allowed others to download, that is copy, material from their hard drives. These networks are typically what are called peer-to-peer -peer networks, abbreviated P2P, because each member of the network, or peer, may connect directly with each other rather than going through a central computer or server. Napster was the most famous example of a file sharing network and, like its many successors, allowed millions of people to download files from one another. Files of any type may be copied, but I will be talking about sound files. The most popular sound file format at the moment is MP3, and although others are in use, I'll use the term MP3 generically. Now, as many of you know, much ink, if not yet blood, has been spilled in the debates over the ethics and legality of file sharing. For millions of files are being zapped across the ether in violation of copyright. And a messy battle between the record industry and file shares has ensued. In fact, if you read the newspapers yesterday or the day before, you'll see that uh, Grokster, one of the main file sharing um, companies, had to shut down after the uh, recent Supreme Court case. But rather less attention has been paid to the effect of file sharing on listeners. In fact, file sharing has had a profound influence on the ways in which tens of millions of listeners around the globe access and experience music. My purpose in this part of the talk is to explore how listeners are integrating file sharing into their musical lives, 
and how it has become for many a tool for living. First, however, we must understand what is distinctive about MP3s and file sharing and how they differ from earlier sound reproduction technologies. There are many ways to consider the distinctive attributes of MP3 sound files, but I would suggest that the most significant is that MP3s and the like are, for practical purposes, intangible. MP3s are not subject to the physical control exerted over traditional recorded media. They cannot be barcoded, price tagged, shrink wrapped, or sequestered on shelves or behind cases. To download an MP3, whether legally through a paid service or illegally over a P2P network, is not like buying a CD. For downloading involves making a copy of a file, not moving it from one place to another. Digital music files are also dramatically more portable than their more tangible kin. Depending on the speed of one's internet connection, a three minute pop song can be downloaded from anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. The nature of digital music files and P2P networking also affects cost. Millions are available free through file sharing. And even when paid for, they typically cost less than a dollar at the pay sites, such as, iTunes, as Apple's uh, music store. So digital music files, intangible, reproducible, portable, and cheap, are clearly different from traditional recording media. How do these differences then affect the listening habits of users? I would like to explore two broad consequences. The first connected to the increased access to music that file sharing allows. The second concerns the rise of internet music communities, specifically through what are known as MP3 blogs. The clearest change that file sharing introduces is the possibility of an unprecedented and unparalleled access to music. This new accessibility may be understood in terms of speed, ease, and breadth. The first two traits, speed and ease, may be seen in the example that opened this paper, or I should say this section of the paper. Uh, I hear a bit of an unidentified song in my car. A few minutes after I get home, I'm listening to it. File sharing not only makes it possible to find particular pieces quickly and easily, it also allows users to explore unfamiliar territory. If one can imagine a particular type of music, it probably exists. If it exists, there's a good chance it could be found on the internet. Now, I should note that access varies according to style and genre. The music of rapper Jay-Z is very easy to find. The music of Alexander Zemlinsky, whom I'm tempted to call AZ, is not. Now, such broadened access to music, which has led to some to describe the internet as a celestial jukebox, has had a significant impact on many file sharers. A study by the research firm Ipsos Reid found that 29% of American respondents reported that their favorite genre of music changed after they started downloading music from the internet, while 21% indicated that they developed new radio listening habits from file sharing. But even if their musical tastes do not fundamentally change, downloaders feel freer to explore unfamiliar genres without the risk of wasting money or time. Over and again, respondents to surveys that I've conducted have noted that they ventured or stumbled into new musical territory in their file sharing and were gratified by the results. A female college student from Baltimore explained, quote, file sharing has made, me much more, has made music much more accessible for me. I never really enjoyed classical music as much as I do now. But without the risk of failure, she delved more deeply into the classical repertoire. Others looked for out-of-print recordings, concert recordings by familiar artists, and remixes or covers of their favorite songs. A 51-year-old consultant from Minneapolis, for example, reported that he has used P2P networks to collect more than 70 versions of the song Lily Marlene. One fascinating manifestation of this new accessibility is what I would describe as a divergent approach to discovering music. Instead of seeking out particular pieces, which we might call a convergent approach, one initiates an intentionally general search in hope of broad and unfamiliar results. For me, a search under the term cello yielded not only the expected box cello suites, it introduced me to Nick Drake's haunting cello song, the works of Apocalyptica, the Finnish cello quartet known for its covers of Metallica, as well as to the riches of Annette Funicello. 
what by all rights should be condemned as a poor search engine, served as my trusted guide into the musical unknown. Even the frequent misattribution of music can be a benevolent aspect of file sharing. There's a certain Cajun indeterminacy about file sharing that allows us to transcend intentionality and achieve a salutary tastelessness. In his provocative 1982 article on being tasteless, William Brooks espoused such an arbitrariness of musical selection, for it avoids imposing pre-existing value systems and makes it possible to approach all music, as he said, quote, with interest and without prejudice. This indeterminacy is strikingly embraced in Apple Computer's ad campaign for its MP3 player, the iPod Shuffle. This player forgoes the, the typical controls and provides only the shuffle feature, which plays songs in a random order. As Apple's website proclaimed last summer, and I quote, random is the new order. Welcome to a life less orderly. As official soundtrack to the random revolution, the iPod Shuffle takes you on a unique journey you never know what's around the next tune. iPod Shuffle adds musical spontaneity to your life. Many downloaders feel that file sharing adds more than just spontaneity to their existence. One college student wrote of her use of Napster, not to search for specific songs, but for moods and emotions. And I quote from her, after a bad breakup, I typed cry, love, hurt, heart, and so on, and found the most soppy song in this case, Anil Sadaka, that trumped my depression and therefore somehow uplifted me. Some of the music captured my pain and helped me as though some artists completely understood me. And then others were so hyperbolic, I felt relatively fortunate and therefore calmed. Or as another college age student explained more generally, file sharing might be one of the best things I got going. I won't comment on that. <laughs> Another aspect of the accessibility file sharing allows is the flexibility to customize one's musical experience. An oft-repeated repla complaint from fans of popular music is that albums seldom have more than two or three tracks that they want to listen to. Many feel that they are forced to buy entire albums for want of a single song. Contributors to P2P bulletin boards and respondents to my surveys tout file sharing as a way to avoid the all or nothing dilemma of CD buying. They, not the artist, producer, or record company, pick out the music and only the music that they want to hear. Though satisfaction with the album format obviously preceded the advent of MP3s, file sharing reinforce, reinforces what might be called singles listening. When listeners get to know an album intimately, the end of one song of an album strongly raises the expectation of the next. For better or for worse, downloaders often miss out on the gestalt of the commercially produced album. Yet they can decide how to group songs based on their own criteria, and these personalized compilations can generate, in turn, their own gestalt. MP3s, so easily moved and manipulated, allow listeners greater control over their musical experience. Or, in the case of the shuffle feature, the paradoxical freedom to give up control as they please. In addition to expanding one's access to and control over recorded music, file sharing has also helped bring listeners together. One of the fascinating manifestations of this phenomenon is the rise and proliferation of internet communities whose focus is the sharing of MP3 music files. There might seem to be nothing more solitary and unsociable, if not antisocial, than sitting in front of a computer downloading music. Yet across the globe, in groups small and large, people are coming together in cyberspace because of common musical tastes and interests. These are communities, but certainly not in the traditional sense. Internet listening communities do not congregate in a shared physical space, and their interactions are largely textual and asynchronous. In such communities, age, class, gender, and race may be ignored or disguised, allowing new hierarchies to arise and a freedom of interaction unlikely in any other way. In the last year or so, a new type of internet musical community has flourished, the MP3 blog. And I'd like to discuss the phenomenon and discuss some of the interesting questions that it raises. Blog, as many of you may well know, is short for web log and is an internet site typically run by a single person or small group 
that variously serves as a diary, scrapbook, soapbox, or op-ed page. MP3 blogs are distinctive in that they contain not only text, but music. The MP3 blogger posts digital files of his or her favorite music with accompanying commentary. Not all MP3 blogs are communities, but community arises when a site gains a critical mass of regular visitors who interact with the blogger and each other. Interestingly, MP3 blogs have, for the most part, not incurred the wrath of the recording industry, quite unlike the other file sharing, quite unlike file sharing networks such as Napster, Kazaa, and as we know, Grokster. This is because MP3 blogs often trade in little known, out of print, or unpublished music, and typically remove files after a short period. Moreover, they strongly encourage listeners to purchase the albums from or attend the concerts of the performers whose music they are downloading. And toward that end, they often provide links to internet, musical re internet music retailers, musicians' websites, and so on. MP3 blogs range from the narrowly specialized to the wildly eclectic. The, uh, the MP3 blog known as the Tofu Hut posts electronic music and has featured video game soundtracks written specifically for the 1980s Commodore 64 computer. Waking Ear is not devoted to any genre, but instead its members post MP3s of what they call earworms, or songs that get stuck in your head. As its welcome page explains, we have a pact, you and I. I write down that song I had in my head when I woke up this morning. You tell me what's in your head right now. We discover new music and maybe learn something about how our minds work. Another blog, Music for Robots, traffics in underground and alternative pop music not usually heard on the radio. Um, I'm going to play an example of a song called The Smoky Turtle by the group uh, called Eyeball Skeleton, which is a trio from Maryland consisting of two brothers, eight and 10 years old, and their father. Uh, the Dada-esque lyrics chronicle the adventures of a breakdancing turtle. He was the smoky when he came around to be the jokey jokey. The smoky turtle, he was the smoky when he came around to be the jokey jokey. The break dancing in Egypt, doing a shout spin on a pyramid turtle. He did the Blitzy Poodle. He did the army box. Uh, if you couldn't understand the lyrics, uh, he was talking about this uh, uh, turtle that was uh, doing a a shell spin on the periods of pyramids of Egypt. Now, the smoky turtle proved to be hugely popular last summer and generated enthusiastic comments from blog readers around the country. 13-year-old Sonia Holtzman from California wrote, and I'm not going to try to do the correct inflections, but, oh my God, I love you guys. I think that's so cool what you're doing. I've been making all my friends listening to you guys because you rock. And you have to see the orthography. Um, yeah, I'm translating. Um, a 16-year-old boy with the online handle peanut butter waffle cone raved, quote, yo, little dudes, I played eyeball skeleton for like six of my friends and they were instantly hooked, no lie. They went home and showed their friends, so you guys are making a name for yourselves in Philadelphia. Then 20, again, another example is 24-year-old Joshua from Georgia who said, pure genius. This totally renewed my faith in music. Please come play in Atlanta. I will set up a great show for you. Keep it up, guys. So as we could see, uh, Eyeball Skeleton would have languished in undeserved obscurity were it not for this uh, MP3 blog. <laughs> now, Soul Sides, another blog, offers lesser known R&B, hip hop, and soul tracks. Like music for robots, Soul Sides attracts a loyal following of readers who engage in passionate discussion and debate. Here, for example, is a playfully sesquipedalian post by a blogger named Gun Yoga. In, toting, in touting a rare Chet Baker find, he directed this aside at those readers who had disagreed with some of his pronouncements. And I quote, it has come to my attention that some of you would like nothing more than to elutriate me from the aegis of the greatness that is my blog. Well, I ain't going nowhere, so get used to me. I'm here to stay like cockroaches, PCBs, and your ignorance. Your pap and pablum simply rolls off my Teflon-coated back. He then threatened to replace all MP3s on the site with extended versions of John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds. 
Tofu Hut, Waking Ear, Music for Robots, Soul Sides. These are just a few of the thousands of MP3 blogs trading in music over the internet. It is perhaps too early to know exactly what impact these blogs will have on our musical life, but it's not too early to start asking questions. For one, how will these blogs affect music commerce? The MP3s are available free, so there's little obvious incentive to pay for the music. Yet the support bloggers and readers express for little-known artists seems sincere. And if their reader listeners are buying in appreciable numbers, will the blogger, this combination of journalist, promoter, and tastemaker, emerge as a significant force in the music business? And how will the characteristic eclecticism of MP3 blogs affect musical taste? I've already argued that file sharing allows and encourages musical exploration. And there's evidence that many of those who download music from the internet feel that they have expanded their musical horizons. Will this eclecticism also affect genre formation? In a recent article, Steve Lee and Richard Peterson make the striking observation of, quote, an emergent class of musical genres not based in an aesthetic of music production, but in an aesthetic shared by consumers. What new genres then might await us? In pointing to the benefits of file sharing, whether the broadened access to music or the community building it makes possible, I may be accused of offering a utopian vision of the technology. I readily admit that I am hardly a disinterested party, for as a scholar, teacher, musician, and music lover, my life and work have been tremendously enriched by my ability to hear and study music of the, of the broadest variety, and with such ease. Yet I recognize that influential technologies are always double-edged, and file sharing is no exception. File sharing can transform the merely curious into the obsessive, the fan into the fanatic, and relentlessly suck up one's time, as I can attest. Moreover, the intangibility of MP3s and the ease with which they are obtained, disseminated, and deleted may encourage the sense that music is just another disposable commodity, and for some, may make music less meaningful. Consider, for example, this lament from a 22-year-old female college student. And I quote, I believe that, utilize, that by utilizing this technology, I lost part of the nostalgia inherent in buying and listening to music. For example, I can listen to my Flaming Lips CD and know that I purchased it in the week after my 15th birthday during my alternative stage in high school. But I cannot do this with MP3s. I acquired so many songs at such a fast rate that listening to this music only reminds me of sitting in front of my computer. Interestingly, many of, the of my college-age survey respondents echoed this nostalgia for compact discs, which in comparison to MP3s are often described, if you can believe this, as authentic and the real thing. So clearly, authenticity is a moving target. However one views the value of file sharing, the larger point I want to make is that something profound is happening to music. The way that current and future generations think about and interact with music will undoubtedly change in response to file sharing, and the, and the phenomenon deserves our attention. We should not let the overheated rhetoric that dominates the discourse surrounding file sharing obscure the fact that we are witnessing what I would argue is one of the most significant developments in modern musical life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. I wonder if anyone has any questions for uh, Dr. Katz. Well, I'm just thinking about Garage Band. And it makes me think of collective works. There have been attempts, I think, on the internet for people to have literary works where they contribute in some sort of collective way and also pictorial ones. Things like GarageBand and its equivalents sort of permit that for music. I don't think the text and picture ones have gotten much traction. I don't know. Do you have an insight into the musical side? Um, that's an interesting question about GarageBand, which, if you don't know, is a, um, a program, software program from Apple that allows you to create, to compose music by um, cutting and pasting loops of different sounds and layering them and, and uh, generating structure through that way. In fact, I um, regularly assign my students a, um, 
composition projects using GarageBand. So it's really opened up composing to people who would never have thought uh, about composing. Uh, but you were asking about the collective nature of composing, and I certainly see this as possible. In fact, I think it's, I'm, I'm sure it's been done. I've heard of, uh, not through GarageBand, but before GarageBand, of a, an MP3 site, which is now defunct, in which um, people would contribute tracks to a server, and, um, and they, would, they would mess around with them and tweak them, and then, and then um, upload them again and create music together, and these people would never be in the same room at the same time. And apparently some very satisfying music came out of this. So I think there is real promise for collective and distant um, composition through, um, through things like GarageBand. Is free a necessary component of this? Do you see people having these same sort of experiences with paid download services like eMusic or iTunes? Or does the barrier have to be so low that you don't pay anything at all for the music? Um, I, I don't think it has to be free. It has to be cheap if people are going to do it. And um, it's 99 cents strikes me as fairly cheap, but I've heard talk of making it much cheaper so that it would be something like five cents a download so that, um, or making it not uh, pay per download, but a subscription pro um, rate, so $12.95 a month, unlimited downloads, and some, I think Napster is doing that. So it has to be cheap. It doesn't have to be free. The interesting thing is um, when I've uh, done surveys of uh, college-age students who are the most, and high school students who are the most apt to download, and ask them if they're willing to pay, they, they often say yes. Um, I think even the majority say yes, a certain amount. Not a lot, but they're willing to pay. And I think there is some psychological um, you know, factor at work here. We seem to value things more when we pay for them. And I think when we pay for something, we, we do hold on to it. We're not uh, as likely to, to just toss it in the uh, virtual garbage can. So I do think that, uh, that people will be willing to pay. Um, it just has to be cheap, and the record companies need to get on board soon before people before a whole generation of listeners has grown up not paying for music. Thank you. Um, how has uh, sampling affected um, music listening habits? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have a whole chapter on that. There's so much you could say. It has affected every type of music, uh, classical music. Uh, there's a, a I talk about a composer named Paul Lansky, who's an, an electronic composer at Princeton. And in the same case study, I'm talking about uh, Public Enemy, who uses sampling. It's created a new form of composition, one that generates music by creating collages of previously existing sound, not just quotes, but actual sound. So it's generated a whole new way of thinking about composing music it also, I think, changes the way people listen to music because they now often listen for references and every piece of music, of course this has always been true, but more so now, every piece of music that is, uh, in which there is sampling generates a, uh, a web of associations with other types of music. So it's changed composition and it's changed performance very deeply. I used to work in the music business for a few years in a number of record labels, and I know that um, the business started off, well, at one point it was mainly singles that were being sold, then albums came up, and I find it interesting that the internet is taking us to a certain extent back to a singles-oriented market, mm -hmm. which I think has always been the natural way. My question to you is, and I, I've been anticipating and thinking that with people shifting towards singles and songs that they like, do you see any kind of correlation with um, people being introduced to a band and then moving to pursue to see that band live? In other words, do you see live performance um, benefiting from this? Or are our attention spans so short and the nature in which we enjoy these songs so short that by the time bands come around, it's come and gone? Well, I, I actually think that, um, and there's a lot of evidence for the fact that, uh, that file sharing has generated interest in live music. 
in my surveys and in surveys uh, that have been done by national firms, a lot of people say that they will, uh, they will get a download of uh, a song, maybe a free, free from the band's website. They like it, they download more, they really get into this band, they, they follow the band around, they go to the concerts. And, and I think this is having a really big impact on the music business because what the small bands, independent bands or unsigned bands are finding is that they can generate an audience without ever releasing an album. In fact, there was a, an article in um, a recent Wired magazine about a band that sold 400,000 albums just through their use, uh, putting their songs on the um, internet site uh, My, MySpace. And they have huge concert followings too. So I think it's creating a new business model for, uh, for popular music. I guess one of the phonograph effects would be the length, the time duration of a song. And certainly for most of the 20th century, for pop songs, the 200 second 78 RPM mm -hmm. record has kind of defined how long a song should, should be. I'm wondering if you've traced or seen how that has changed uh, in more recent time, once we've gotten past the 78 RPM limit. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, it's had a huge impact on the length of songs. Uh, for example, in jazz, uh, jazz was usually improvised and could go on as long as people wanted to keep dancing or listening. But when in the studio, you have to stop at three minutes, four minutes, whatever the length of the side is. So it really has determined the length of a lot of pieces. But it's not just popular music, in classical music too. Um, uh, people have long suspected that the violinist Fritz Kreisler, who composed a lot of uh, little uh, violin showpieces, was, uh, was writing for the phonograph. And in fact, there's the Fritz Kreisler collection here. And something very interesting that I found is that uh, in looking at a manuscript of his, of his work, Caprice Viennois, he had um, scratched out a whole section of, of the piece. And what I realized is that that piece made it go over the four minute mark. And I just suspect that when he realized that he had that when he had gone too far and couldn't put this on recording or would have had to put it on another side, he shortened it. But uh, your question about whether this persists or whether things have changed, well, <clears throat> certainly people feel free to have five minute songs, six minute songs, but I think this persisted for so long, really from uh, the early 1900s to uh, the 19, late 1940s and and then singles became the uh, most popular format that people are just used to hearing songs in three in three minute pieces and have not only done that but have now started composing in such a way to generate a satisfying structure within three minutes. So I think in a sense we're stuck with this short song. Uh, people f are free to experiment with it, but I don't th I don't see that as going away. Um. The, uh, the record labels, for that, for that matter, the movies, uh, claim their astronomical losses by imputing that every file downloaded is an album not sold or uh, a DVD not sold, uh, and you've got, of course, uh, billions, including what happens in China. Uh, this doesn't seem very logical. Is, are there any studies of how much uh, loss they actually suffer from uh, file downloading? Yes, um, that's, I, it's just not true that every album or song downloaded is a song or album not purchased. Uh, because people might not have bought it otherwise. Um, a lot of people use downloading as a way to um, decide what they want to buy and then buy it. A lot of people just uh, want to have the real thing, as they say. And there have been studies. Um, now, I can't remember the name. A professor at a uh, university in Texas did show that um, uh, he did he did contradict what he calls the annihilation hypothesis, that, uh, that file sharing is annihilating the music business, and found a small, a, an appreciable but very small effect on music sales. But in fact, there are so many other factors. Um, the rise of, in popularity of video games is um, keeping people from uh, diverting money from, uh, teenage money from CDs to video games. Uh, DVDs are diverting money. Um, the fact that uh, the record industry has sort of saturated the market with CDs has also had that effect. So there is an effect on sales, but I think it's a little disingenuous to say that uh, that loss is equal to the number of uh, songs or albums downloaded.
I was wondering if you'd seen any effects uh, on, in the switch from analog to digital recording techniques. Oh, uh, from analog to digital. Well, digital makes so many things possible that weren't possible before. Um, there is something called uh, digital signal processing that can change music, that can change um, the pitch of a single note. That can I mean, there's something called auto tune that I can sing out of tune. I'm a terrible singer, so if I were to sing into auto tune, in goes my terrible out of tune voice. Out comes in real time in tune you know, um, singing. And um, there's also what's called rhythm quantization, where just like um, with uh, auto-tuning, instead of bumping something up or down to the nearest semitone, it bumps something uh, forward or back to the nearest eighth note or sixteenth note. So if you hear a lot of, um, of pop singing, if you listen carefully, you can get the sense that they're being auto-tuned and quantized, um, because then you hear them live and they can't sing at all. But um, so it's had, it's had a a tremendous impact. It also means that you can have good-looking people who can't sing, um, because what's uh, it's it's really changed the emphasis from the visual from the audio to the visual. So, just I could keep going explaining how how the digital has had an impact. But those are some examples. With that in mind, and going back to your comments about performance, live performances, um, how live are those performances? That's, that's a good question. How live are some of these performances? Some of them are not very live. Um, if you see someone hanging upside down and singing, they're probably not singing. Um, if they're running and sprinting or laying on their backs, they're probably not singing. Um, so there's a lot of lip syncing going on. Uh, interestingly, that seems to be fine with the people who go to these concerts, because they're going to the concerts to see the spectacle. If you go to a Britney Spears concert, you want to see what's going on. You don't. You could. You could just listen to the CD for the, um, for the the sound only. So, um, a lot of pop concerts are not really live. Um, now, classical, yes, uh, we have yet to um, go into that territory. That will be scary. Um, but uh, but uh, in pop music, you see a lot of concerts that really aren't live. Anyone else? Yes. At the beginning of your talk, you asked us to imagine not having recorded sound, and I'm intrigued by what you've ex explored about the sharing of files and also about the MP3 blogs. Asking you to project yourself into the future of your career as a musicologist, what would you wish that libraries would share of those materials so oh. that you could have that Ooh. research material in the future? That's a great question. I would love uh, for some of these blogs to be archived. Um, they just disappear um, within a week. Um, not Well, sometimes the whole site disappears, but um, the whole idea of these things is that they're temporary, so as not to threaten copyright holders. But um, And that's understandable. But as a scholar, I would love to be able to go back and find the, uh, the file that had Smoky Turtle. You can't find that anymore. It's gone. Um, I have it, though. You, so <laughs> um, so uh, email me. But. Um, so I would love to see uh, I would love to see some of these archived. It would be a huge undertaking, but as a scholar, that would be so valuable to see how uh, to see how the MP3 blogs were really chronicling musical life. I couldn't, I couldn't help but think about the other benefits of music. Listening to you talk today, of course, one who studied music would immediately think of Verdi and his operas and, and the role that they played in the unification of Italy and also more recently in the Middle East where a huge number of young teena teenagers in the Middle East got their first taste of democracy by doing what? By voting for their favorite pop music artist. So um, again, thank you so much for coming today and know that the book if you'd like to hold it up for us again, <clears throat> is <laughs> Capturing Sound. And thank you all for coming, and thank you, Dr. Katz. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.